Welcome to the Be Love audiobook. This book is dedicated to four of my greatest teachers. My wife, Lisa Burwell, my mother, Mary Burwell, my father, Tim Burwell, and my grandmother, Ann Wilson. My wife taught me how to be loved. Her grace and perfection has taught me a deeper meaning of love. My mother taught me how to love. When I was a little boy, my mother filled my heart with love. I drew from it until I learned how to love myself. My father taught me how to be brave. His creative intelligence and fearless heart taught me I can do anything. And my grandmother taught me how to listen to the love in me. She was wise beyond words. A special thanks goes to my mother-in-law, Shirley Anderson. Shirley, your support gave me the courage to dive into my heart and go for my dream of writing a book. I'm not sure if this book would be in my hands today without your love and support. Thank you, Sati Lehman and Joanne Harmon, for proofreading my book. You both were a gift from God for this project. You came along just at the right moment when I needed some guidance and wisdom. And lastly, I'd like to thank my editor, Myrna Ryback. Thank you for all the hard work and trade knowledge you poured into this book. Your experience and wisdom were greatly appreciated. The Preface This book began to take shape in my early 20s when I was just beginning to awaken to something within. I spent the first 20 years of my life covering myself up. I then spent the next 20 years shaking off all the things I had layered over myself. When I was a young boy, my grandmother invoked a tide of silence in me. And at the height of my sadness, I needed the peace that she had revealed to me in my early adolescence. By my 20s, the voices in my head had a chokehold on me. And I'd reached a point where I could not move forward. My anger had come to a boil. Defeated and broken, I felt I had nowhere left to turn. And in a moment of desperation, I cried out to God, please help. I wasn't religious or spiritual in the least, but I was desperate. A few days later, I received a call from a local doctor who wanted to bring his nephew in for a tattoo. When he arrived with his nephew in tow, the doctor was out of control. I think he had had about two or three pots of coffee that morning. He was bouncing all over my studio, and during the session, he was rubbing homeopathic cream all over his nephew's tattoo with his bare hands. I promptly let him know that he was cross-contaminating my workspace, but my words fell on deaf ears. I think he found it all quite amusing. His nephew's tattoo was going to take about three sessions, so before they left, we booked him in for two more sittings. However, the doctor requested that I book the next session for my last sitting of the day so I could join him and his nephew at his home for some drinks. I was curious enough to oblige him in his offer. After the next tattoo session, as promised... I followed the doctor and his nephew back to his home. While the doctor and I were having a beer in his kitchen, he told his nephew, go get the room ready. I was taken aback, and questions were streaming through my mind. What room? Ready for what? Where's the room? But I shook off my suspicions and resolved that if things got out of hand, I'd be ready. About 15 minutes later, the nephew reappeared, proclaiming, The room was ready, the room was ready. I was then ushered into the living room and pointed towards the doorway. The doctor and his nephew were both wearing a look of a mischievous anticipation. You first, the doctor said. And again, I felt things were getting a little strange. But I was curious, curious enough to proceed. I opened the door and I was greeted with a glow of black lights. Looking down the stairwell, I could see lava lamps and hundreds of records and CDs and psychedelic posters. It turned out the doctor was harmless. But during my time 
in his home that night. We both got drunk and shared some good laughs. That evening, the doctor talked about a lot of things I didn't understand. I had no idea what words like duality, androgyny, ego, unity. I didn't have a clue what any of those words meant. And why was he talking about the nature of my soul? Then things got a little strange near the end of the evening. My host made his way across the room and he was leaning over me and he's poking me in the chest and he's yelling in my face, are you ready to die for what you believe in? I pushed him away and I told him he was crazy. That evening ended shortly after that. About two weeks later, I was alone with suicidal thoughts coursing through my mind. I could no longer stand the insanity of my mind. I decided I was going to go for a ride on my motorcycle just to get myself in a better space. During my ride, I saw a brick building at the end of a long strip of road. I accelerated, intending to drive into the wall at about 150 kilometers. But as I sped closer to that brick wall, I could hear the doctor's voice echoing in my mind. I recalled some of the words in the strange experiences I had in his home that evening. Even though I could not consciously comprehend what he was talking about, my soul did. His words were now screaming in my mind, and time suddenly froze as I flew towards the wall. The experience at the doctor's house was flashing through my mind in slow motion. It was like I was back on his couch in the psychedelic room. Seconds later, I turned around and headed to the doctor's house. I knew he had something I needed. As I stood at his door, I could barely muster up the courage to lift my arm to ring his doorbell. I was in a dark place and emotionally spent. I pushed the button and took a step back and waited. That was the moment my life changed. When he arrived to the door, I was in tears. And he just looked at me and said, what do you want? This was not the greeting I expected. And my response was, I want what you have. I'm not happy. I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what's wrong with me. Can you help me? And his reply was, I guess you better come in. We'll talk about that. I followed him back down to the psychedelic room and he talked me off the ledge. Afterwards, he opened another door to a room that was full of milk crates, floor to ceiling, packed full of spiritual books. The doctor and I sorted through the books and he gave me about a dozen to take home. Along with the books, he gave me clear instructions read the books, then come back and we'll talk about them. He then said, if you don't read them, consider them a gift and don't ever bother me again. True desperation takes hold when nothing behind you looks good and nothing around you looks good and what lies in the future no longer has any appeal. Moments before he, I rang his doorbell, I was desperate. For a reason I didn't understand, and for a reason that was much bigger than me, I had arrived. This was my point of awakening. It was up to me now to decide whether I was going to take his guidance. I didn't feel like I had any other option than to go forward. So there I stood with a handful of books and what seemed to be a faint whisper from my heart promising great things ahead. I read the books in record time, placing sticky notes in the columns with all my questions. By the time I finished reading them, there seemed to be more sticky notes than pages. The doctor and I became best friends, and we spent a great deal of time together over the course of an eight-year period. During our time as friends, he answered all my questions, as well as some I hadn't even known to ask. He was the answer to my prayers. He helped me save my life. That experience was over 20 years ago, and my time with the doctor was just the beginning of my adventure. Along my path, I've been blessed to to meet and spend time with many great teachers, as well as a few masters. 
Some of the messages you will find in this book are things that the doctor and I talked about. Will other words of wisdom found between these pages come from the eight years I spent with a group of monks? Still, other teachings are from my studies at the University of Western Ontario. And another portion of this book was downloaded into me. The result of a trip I took to the pyramids outside of Mexico City. I believe that all these experiences have been given to me by the grace of God. Thomas Keating once said, I think God sometimes picks the most unlikely candidates just to exercise his ingenuity. It is my wish that this book turns you inward and points you towards your empowerment. I want to poke you in the chest and yell, are you ready to live on purpose? Take what you like from this book and have your own experience. After years of searching for truth and peace, I've discovered that I carry inside of me my own truth. No one has my truth but me. As for peace, it's not obtained. It's already within us. All we ever need to do is surrender to it. And by the end of your life, you will have made thousands of mistakes. Those mistakes will be easier to live with than one single regret for not following your heart.